want to talk about the word spiritual, and I want to make sure I'm mic'd up. I want to talk about the word spiritual, and I use it in somewhat the same sense that Cindy Wigglesworth used it a little bit earlier today. I don't mean spiritual in the conventional religious sense. I mean spiritual somewhat the way she meant it, as a mind that is richly stocked with narratives and stories and wisdom traditions of our civilization, but not just in an academic way, in a way that those narratives are actually used in daily life to empower and to enrich it. So I want to talk about how I use narratives in my own journey of deafness to hearing. So this is a diagram of a lot of hardware that is inside my head. I'm deaf. I was born partly deaf. My mother had rubella when she was pregnant with me. So I was born unable to hear speech. I didn't hear language until I got hearing aids when I was three and a half years old. It was only then that I began to acquire speech to become human. I used hearing aids for the next 33 years, until I was 36 years old. And then on July 1st, July 7th, 2001, I suddenly lost all the rest of my hearing. Quas unknown. I thought my hearing aid batteries were dying. It wasn't my batteries, it was my ears that were dying. So the next step for me was to get a cochlear implant. So let me run you quickly through cochlear implant 101. So what you see here is a cutaway diagram of a cochlear implant. If you look at the blown up portion, you can see that there are 16 tiny electrodes that are spiraled through the inner ear. The job of those electrodes is to stimulate the auditory nerves inside the inner ear. And when those auditory nerves are stimulated, they send sound information to the brain. The reason I'm deaf, which is the reason that most deaf people are deaf, is because of a breakdown in the inner ear. The job of the inner ear is to convert sound waves into electrical impulses, sound to electricity. That's what the inner ear does. It's that snail-shaped organ, the red one that you see down there. It's called the cochlea, Latin word for snail. Well, on July 7, 2001, my inner ear stopped working. The only choice I had left was to use a cochlear implant that converts sound into electrical impulses and delivers them directly to my auditory nerves. And on the outside of my head, I wear devices that pick up sound and digitize it and send it through my skin using these magnetic antennas to a chip inside my head that decodes the signal and decides which electrodes to trigger. So that's cochlear implant 101. So that day of going deaf, that was my departure. Now let me talk about my initiation. This is a slide that I like to show people in the late afternoon when they're starting to get hungry for dinner. <laughs> what you're seeing here is a cochlear implant once the surgical process has been finished, but before the skin has been sutured or on top of it. So the ear would be back here. The ear canal would be around here. So you are looking down on the head where the implant, where the headpiece sticks. So one nice thing I like about this shot is that on the outside it says this side out. The reason is, this is a magnet. If it's not the side out, the headpiece will fly off the head. This is an initiation into being a cyborg. And I use that word with a little bit of irony and humor. But the fact is that this really is a computer. When my audiologist showed me this, this is what it looks like inside. She let me hold one of these in my hand, and I looked at it. 
And I thought, oh my God, it really is a computer. But this thing, it's digital, it's angular, it's cold, it's rectangular, and it's going to go inside my body, which is warm, sticky, and wet. How is that going to happen? How will that combination work? Well, let me try to give you some inkling of what the world sounds like to me. So what this is here, what I'm going to play for you in a moment, is an electronically filtered sentence in English. It has been electronically filtered to resemble the output of a cochlear implant. The ink channel will give you a rough idea of what I heard that first day when my device was first turned on. The 16 channel version will give you an inkling of what I heard a year later when I got my software upgraded. <laughs> my software upgraded. The way that's done is by putting new software into the processor. There's no surgery involved. And then I'll play for you the original unedited sound file so that you can get an inkling of the difference between what you hear and what I hear. Okay, could you play the A-channel simulation, please? I like to play tennis. Once more, please. I like to play tennis. How many people can tell what that says? Any guesses? Lots of people. What do you think? I like to play tennis. Does anybody think it's, I like to play chess? A couple people do. All right, would you play the 16 channel version for me, please? I like to play tennis. Now, can you hear the difference between eight and 16? Play it again, if you would, 16. I like to play tennis. The reason it sounds better is because it is doubling the frequency resolution. So it gave me, instead of eight channels, 16 channels. Well, how does that compare to a normal ear? Very roughly speaking, a normal ear has about 20,000 channels. Play the original, if you would. I like to play tennis. So you can hear from that there's a big difference between what I hear and what you hear. But there's two important facts. First, this 16-channel version, as scratchy as it sounds, is still what allows me to use the telephone, to listen to the radio, to hear you saying, I like to play tennis, is what allows me to be part of the auditory world. Nonetheless, it's not bionic hearing. So when I got this cochlear implant, my first thought was, that day that I went deaf was, first, now it's time to get a cochlear implant. But my second thought was, I'll bet I can write a book about this. And that was my journey. I literally wrote my way through deafness. So this is my first book, Rebuilt, How Becoming Part Computer Made Me More Human. And you can actually see the implant there in my skull. That's, that's my skull. That's not somebody else's skull. So it is not a book that was written looking back on the experience. It's a book that I wrote as I was having the experience. And one of the things that sustained me as I was going through that was to think back to the myths and the narratives and the legends that I absorbed as somebody who read a lot of literature. One of them was the Odyssey, that story of departure, trials, and homecoming. And this helped me think about my experience as not just simply a gigantic pain in the ass, but as a journey, as that I had lost something, my body had broken down, I went through this ritualistic surgical experience, and then I heard again in a way that was shockingly different from how I had heard before. Another myth that sustained me through that period was Martin Caden's book, Cyborg, which was published in 1973. I'm not recommending it as literature, but one of the great things this book did was the protagonist, Steve Austin, who was the inspiration for that show, The Six Million Dollar Man, which really was the defining cyborg imagery of my generation. The Steve Austin went through a lot of frustration and anger and agitas as he tried to figure out his new body, as he tried to understand the rules of the changed body in which he suddenly found himself. That was very much the process that I went through 
as I wrote the book. So this was not just a book, but a journey as well. I also wrote another book afterwards, a couple of years later, where I tried to take it to a higher level. But let's stick with the cyborg for now. So there's a very famous essay by Donna Haraway called The Cyborg Manifesto. It, 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 it was very influential in the 1980s. And one of the things she said was, the cyborg is an ultimate self, untied at last in all dependency, a man in space. Now, Cy now Haraway was not making the statement unironically. She was holding the statement up for examination. But here's another example of a cyborg. So first of all, it's not a man. She's not in space, and she's clearly not untied from all dependency. And one of the important things that I learned in my journey was how much closer I was being tied to the mechanical civilization in which we find ourselves. I'm sure we all have these fantasies of going off to live on a desert island, okay? Not using plumbing, living off the land. I can't do that anymore. If I want to live on a desert island, I would have to have an extension cord several hundred miles long so that I can recharge my batteries. So I'm very much entwined in the computational and mechanical apparatus of our civilization. But the point that I was probing after in my book was that this technology, instead of making me remote, mechanical, you know, that whole 1980s mythos of Terminator and Robocop, going through that journey gave me the, the opportunity to rethink how I connected to the other people in my life. Because I spent three months in between deafness and activation completely unable to hear. I was completely deaf for three months. And I spent that time lip reading. So to wrap up, this is my return. My hearing and noise test scores. January 2002, 17%. Two years later, I'd gone up to 70%. That was my return. Thank you very much.